Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming. At uh, this is the I think just one day before the Easter weekend. I know everybody is excited to go back to homes, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I came uh, in the, not the great time, but uh, I think you will have. A, I wish you all the best uh, with your holiday coming up. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Joka, uh, uh, inviting me again and. Uh, Edina, yeah, we have been doing for a long time work. Uh, I met uh, uh, Joka, I think 1992, three, right? Yeah, first, time. first time, yes, yeah. So we have been doing work on digestions, uh, to many other things uh, with Raymond Barnes group. So it has been a long uh, collaboration uh, with uh, Joakim. So once again, it is uh, my pleasure to be here in San Carlos, uh, and uh, it's a great time I'm having, yeah, all right. <laughs> and um, today, uh, what we are going to do is uh, we're going to look at uh, these uh, gold nanoparticles and their uh, uptake uh, with uh, rice plants. You know, the rice is uh, one of the major staple food in the world. And also the rice consumption is increasing in the United States in the last 20 years. Uh, with the invention of uh, rice cookers, I guess, uh, it's very easy, fast, and so it's a very big source of uh, um, carbohydrates and also a lot of particularly zinc uh, and other nutrients. Uh, so we will look at uh, the rice, uh, uh, how these gold nanoparticles uptake, okay? Uh, you can stop at any time and you can ask, ask, ask any questions, uh, so you're welcome to do so. Uh, before we start, uh, this is uh, in the Pioneer Valley, which we are familiar with. I think Joka used to live very close to this town, Sunderland. Yeah, that's the place he was living. I live in, uh, I live in Amherst. Uh, uh, oops. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, that's from the Sugar Loaf. Uh, this is the uh, this is the Connecticut River. Uh, that's the major river which flows through the what we call New England. It's because it's a, like a little bit like England in this region. Uh, and this is the uh, very um, this is called Holyoke Mount um, uh, Holyoke Range which is interesting, one of the oldest uh, formations in that part of the area in the United States, but it goes from east to west, not north to south. And it's a volcanic region, you know, billions of years ago. And uh, this, this Connecticut River goes, you know, going like that, you know, that's what it co called uh, by Native Americans, they used to call river goes uh, with all sort of curves, yeah? That's what Connecticut comes up. Uh, so, um, we grow a lot of corn in this area, and potatoes and stuff like that. And main uh, thing that we do here is education. There are five colleges, uh, five colleges. Yeah, one of the good colleges are there, including University of Massachusetts. Uh, and other than that, education, that's their main business, main economy. And other than that, it's a nice place to live, and we go a little bit of uh, everything. And when I took this picture from Mount Sugarloaf, I thought I can see these same things uh, if you can look at on a lace ablation, you know. Uh, these things become, uh, see the rivers and these uh, fields and the mountains, this, they can be the elemental intensities, <laughs> right? So if you're looking at it like that, so that's also inspiration uh, for that, right? So that's what we will see, some of that in the afternoon too, series of things on elemental bioimaging. And over the years, I became um, an analytical chemist to more of an interdisciplinarian, you know, I can do a lot of work with different, different fields. So I moved uh, quite a bit of multidisciplinary, that's fun. Uh, and I learn every day, working in interdisciplinary field, yeah? 
other than um, you know analytical chemistry you learn new things you know this is the fun part of it yeah uh, so the learning is never ends yeah and so this is another shot actually his town he used to be there so this is a typical new england town of that and this is a long staple of those churches uh, and this is hampshire college uh, where, uh, where I teach, uh, actually this is dormitories, uh, dormitories for students, and they have their greenhouses, and these guys who live in here, and they is mainly interested in greenhouses and stuff like that for the fun, and these are student dormitories, and uh, my work is, so this is the School of Natural Science Laboratory, I, my labs are located on the second floor, of this side of the thing, so there's uh, so with that little introduction from where I am uh, coming from, and then uh, I shall thank first uh, a couple of stu uh, students and my co-workers. Uh, that is uh, Jeremy Coleman, who graduated last year. Now he's on Fulbright in India, and he did part of this work at Thomas Leland. Uh, he's also graduated, he started this project in the summer and then uh, we were working for the last two, uh, three years. Uh, one by one did most of the uh, hydroponic experiments and my colleague Bao Shan Singh who is in plant and soil insect sciences. Now these are the plants and soil guys, so we will take the different work. So this is a contribution from uh, both, uh, both uh, uh, institution from Hampshire and as well as University of Massachusetts. And so the nanoparticles, yeah? Nano means, uh, by that mean is dwarf, you know, like little dance, dwarf, yeah? Nano. Uh, particle dimensions are capable of power one, one billionth of a meter, one billionth of a meter, right? And so it's we call nano uh, size particles. And typically, by definition, they should be less than 100 nanometers, as the grain consider as uh, nanoparticles. And then you have naturally occurring nanoparticles, DNA, and all those other molecules are naturally occurring. And then you have a new class of uh, uh, material called engineered nanoparticles, or ENM. And they started, you know, last 25 years. But has increased quite a lot, and oftentimes it's like several few patterns in this one nanometer range. And as you know, um, this is the beginning of many of the nanoparticle work by Bucky Bowles, yeah, uh, the Rice University Smiling Group. And these are some of the nano layer structures, and then you have carbon nanotubes, you many people know that. And so you have a slew of engineered nanoparticles, and these are mainly made out of carbon to these uh, nanomaterials. And uh, here is another set of uh, uh, nanomaterials, these are called quantum dots, and they are metal based, uh, usually uh, cadmium selenide, cadmium sulfide, and indium arsenide, for example. And you can tune these nanoparticles to get all sort of uh, emission wavelengths. Just you need to have imagination uh, to engineer this thing. That's all. You know, you can get fun, fun colors and you can do all sort of uh, interesting stuff uh, with the quantum dots. Uh, then also, we, I am not uh, going to talk about this one. We have been working with quite a bit on another class of. Uh, Material uh, called nano zero ion in CDI. We synthesize them in our labs, and they have a lot of uh, absorption and redox properties with the CDI. And these are uh, we synthesize about 20 nanometers, very small particles, on uh, uh, 6 to 80 and kind of 10 to 15 nanometer uh, and density. Then, uh, then also you have nano titanium and nano silver and so forth. All are metal based. Uh, then uh, the nanoproducts. Uh, nanoproducts are uh, booming now, you know, lots of applications. And these are uh, silver based nanoparticles, uh, you can make the non smelly socks. Yeah, I, I like that when I'm trying to 
means or something like that. And then uh, you have uh, all sort of nano sized detergents, and then you, have, you can use it in lots of materials, brackets, and also bicycle frames, and jet, you know, jet skis, and so forth. And also, you can change some of the surface properties uh, of clothes and stuff like that. And also, nano titanium on some hand products and so forth. So, it's, they are everywhere. Uh, so, I said they are everywhere. And uh, now, the question is what will happen? You know, eventually, there will be some of these products will be in the environment. That's the part that we are interested in not only production, but what will happen after that, yeah? This is what happened 30, 40 years ago. All these new products came, uh, late and all those things. They are great, they are great, but uh, why do you think about what will happen and things like that, and the fate and transport properties of that. So we are interested in fate and transport properties of these nanoparticles in the uh, So the, uh, US EPA is also uh, proactively working on this one. Uh, because they did the mistake earlier, you know, after the fact, you know, called output control. Uh, you, you know, all those regulations are what you call output control. Yeah? Uh, not the great way to handle pollution units. The best one is to do is input control. Before the thing, yeah? For example, taking out the lead out of gasoline is Tremendous effect that the dead levels are went down. That means you're cutting down the source, right? So now our output control has its, its more just controllable things there. So uh, what we are interested in is doing this kind of thing, what will happen. That and, you know, get a good sense of uh, negative aspects of, uh, or positive aspects of nano products. So if you look at uh, this in this cartoon, fate and transport properties, uh, you have nanoparticles. Um, these guys get, uh, those who are working with nanoparticles knows that they quickly get aggregated. Yeah, so this is the problem. Some of the nano properties goes away uh, with the aggregation. Yeah, this is the problem. You know, you can make a particles, but real one, you know, it get aggregated, basically clumping. Yeah, then it become micro size. Yeah, uh, so this is the sum of the problem: aggregation issues, and also it get adsorbed into humic particles, soils particles, and so forth and so forth. And then, if you look at on the other side, um, they will go into the groundwater. They can bioaccumulate. Yeah, uh, plants and fish and animals and so forth, that's what we are interested in. And also planktons and stuff like that uptake, and then it get biotransformed. So this, this area is very little known, and it took off last five, six years. There are a lot of uh, papers on these kind of things in ES and T, uh, if you look at it, uh, fate and transport properties of nanoparticles. Everybody is okay so far, yeah? And so the toxicity of nanoparticles coming from the size, the size is important, uh, surface properties, so you have a lot of high surface area, so you can do lots of adsorption and all sort of things, yeah? And also depend on the shape, shape of the thing. And also surface chemistry, surface chemistry determine the fate and transport properties of that. And in particular, the charge. They can have a negative, positive, and uh, a neutral particle. So that will have another uh, issue. So these are the things that one need to be considered when you are thinking about fit and transport properties of and toxicity of nanoparticles. Yeah. And um, here we are working with gold nano gold nanoparticles. Uh, that's we call uh, AUNP or gold nanoparticles, and it's uh, widely used in targeted delivery of pharmaceuticals, gold-based uh, pharmaceuticals, and also you can use uh, for clinical and cancer diagnostic using gold as a sensor, uh, and in fact that lead into potentially a targeted biomedical imaging, targeted biomedical imaging.